The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 1440, 1440 in the name of Mike McKenzie on Energy Storage Network. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who would like to contribute could press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Mike McKenzie to open the debate. Seven minutes please, Mr McKenzie. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to have secured this debate in order to shine a light on energy storage because energy storage is often forgotten, a forgotten aspect of our energy system and it's sometimes an undervalued part of our energy system and, and yet energy storage is a fundamental and critical part of our energy system. And I'm grateful to Scottish Renewables for their report, Energy Storage, The Basics, because I've been perhaps as guilty as anyone in not previously properly considering and giving due prominence to the important matter of energy storage. Before I continue, though, President Officer, I'd like to do something that I don't believe I've ever done before in this chamber. Indeed, it's something I may never do again. I want to pay a tribute to a Labour politician. I want to pay a tribute to the late, great Labour Secretary of State, Tom Johnson. Because it was Tom Johnson who brought hydropower to the Highlands and Islands, bringing, bringing into being both hydroelectricity generation and pump storage on a scale that we've not since really matched. And in doing so, he left us a legacy that continues to benefit the Highlands and Islands to this day. In his wisdom, he recognised that what would benefit the Highlands and Islands would also benefit Scotland. Well, Certainly. Uh, Michael Russell. I think the member will be, it would be useful for the member to know that Tom, the admiration for Tom Johnson spreads across this chamber. I seem to remember that the portrait of Tom Johnson was hanging in Butte House when the previous First Minister was there. Many of us regard Tom Johnson as the precursor of at least part of the type of Scotland we'd like to see. Mike McKenzie. Yes, I'm very, very grateful to Mr Russell for that information. I hadn't realised his portrait was in Butte House. Um, but in, 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 in Tom Johnson's wisdom, he recognised that what would benefit the Highlands and Islands would also benefit Scotland. And in his wisdom, he recognised that what would benefit Scotland would also benefit the rest of the UK. And it's this kind of wisdom that's quite evidently so lacking in today's unionist politicians. And it's sometimes forgotten that Tom Johnson also introduced storage heaters, storing energy at times of low demand, bringing affordable, convenient heating to the Highlands and Islands on a significant scale, utilising energy that would otherwise be wasted by storing it at the household level. President Officer, I mention this to demonstrate that even without renewable energy generation, energy storage was and is both necessary and worthwhile. It's used to help balance the peaks and troughs of demand and supply. It's used... Alex Hammond. Just say that Tom Johnson also tried to exterminate the Scots midge, but that was less successful. But the point I was going to make was he took the emergency legislation to enable the hydroelectric board as it became to do its work uh, through all its procedures in, I think, 10 days in the House of Commons. There, there might be a lesson for us all there. Mike McKenzie. I'm very grateful to um, Mr Salmon for that further information. And uh, like midges, a lot of small Scotsmen are equally difficult to exterminate. <laughs> So it's used to also provide a degree of energy secu security. And the pump storage facility at Kruchen provides that initial black start power to jumpstart the system in the event of a system-wide failure. With the advent and all the possibilities and opportunities of renewable energy, energy storage is obviously also even more critical. The critics of wind energy 
often quote the self-evident fact that the wind doesn't blow all the time, although they may not have talked to some of my constituents in Tyree. But this is a backwards-looking Luddite view of centralised energy production that fails to recognise that this energy system is already failing us. And the evidence for this failure is in high energy costs, with fuel poverty across Scotland running at over 30% and over 50% now in some of our islands. And the evidence for this failure is in spare capacity generation, now an all-time and dangerous low, according to National Grid, of only 1.2%. And the evidence for this failure is in the UK government's enormous subsidy for the untried and untested EPR reactor at Hin Hinkley Point, and in their desperation having to bribe the Chinese to invest in this risky venture. The solution to this problem and the way forward is to embrace the possibility of clean, green, renewable energy generation. And Scotland has the possibility of generating many times our own energy requirements. And the variety of storage solutions is limited only by our ingenuity and by our extraordinary capabilities for technological innovation, something we Scots have been good at for generations. There is no single magic bullet. Pump storage, hydrogen, flywheels, ever cleverer and bigger batteries, compressed air, electric vehicles and other new and emerging technologies all offer exciting energy storage solutions. And there are a number of reasons why we must increase both our renewable energy generation and in tandem our, our energy storage capability. We need to do so to meet our climate change targets. We need to do so because as world energy demand continues to rise, we need to increase our energy security. And we need to do so because we have a huge competitive advantage in these technologies and therefore a huge economic opportunity, both at home in capturing this enormous resource and abroad in exporting our skills and the technologies we develop. Technologies and skills where we are already well ahead of the rest of the world. Presiding officer, the only missing ingredient in bringing all this to fruition is the lack of political will from the UK government, who need to recognise, as Tom Johnson's did, that what is good for Scotland can also be good for the rest of the UK. And as we consider our constitutional future, we need to remember that the aim of constitutional change is to enable the delivery of good government. And an essential part of good government lies in enabling us to capture our economic opportunities, especially in sectors like energy, where we have such a huge competitive advantage. We have already stood by and watched as much of our oil wealth was squandered. It would be a tragedy if we are forced to watch the same thing happen to a renewable energy opportunity. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Sarah Boyack to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And can I kick off by thanking um, and congratulating Mike McKenzie for actually securing this debate tonight. It might not look like the most exciting debate we have this week, but I would argue it's probably one of the most important that we debate in the Parliament. So I welcome the fact that Mike has put it on the agenda for us tonight. The challenges that he mentioned, fuel poverty, 39% um, of our households, the missing the climate targets, um, the challenge on meeting our electricity from renewables target, the stalling in the transformation we need across our economy, partly due, as Mike McKenzie said, to the chopping and changing both investment and regulatory framework from the UK government, and the intermittent challenge. We are now beginning to power ahead with lots of different levels and scales in terms of renewables, particularly wind renewables, but we haven't got the grid, we haven't got the storage back up to really maximise on that economic and that energy opportunity. So we've got huge challenges 
But I, I think the, one of the key areas I would agree with Mike McKenzie on is we do now have technologies. We have now invented technologies that can fix many of these challenges, that can help us deliver security of supply, that can help us use the energy that we're currently wasting because we're not able to store it. So for that reason, I particularly welcome the research that's been done and the briefings we've been presented with tonight from WWF and Scottish Renewables, because these new technologies are key to our economic and our climate future in Scotland. It's green, key to a green energy transition with jobs, affordable heat and energy, and a climate-friendly energy network. And there has to be no one solution, no one size fits all. This does play to the Highlands and Islands contribution. It plays to villages, it plays to towns, and it also plays to cities. We will all have different opportunities in terms of the geography and the local circumstances. But what we need is to look at the range of technologies in terms of energy and heat storage that are now available and work out what is best in all of those areas. And the ambition that we had in post-war the Labour government was about the mix of regulation, about the mix of key partners and crucially looking at the huge opportunity from large hydro. Now we've got many, many more opportunities with community hydro schemes which are now coming back into vogue and they have a particular opportunity because they can be community owned and the benefits come to the communities. There are other technologies we need to look at, battery technology. Um, I've seen on egg that fantastic opportunities that they've been able to develop using battery technology. But as the years go by, by the time we hit 2020, 2025, we need to have cars, bikes, buses, vehicles, using battery storage in terms of electricity. And that will begin to transform how we use the electricity that is being produced but is not being used. Hydrogen fuel cells, also huge and exciting potential. And I think one of the opportunities that's currently being pursued is at a community level. Um, and I think particularly some of the, the work that's been done in the Northern Isles is very exciting. We need to make sure that that begins to roll out right across the economy. And the final point I want to end on is thermal storage. Probably not the most exciting end of this, but potentially the most transformational. Let's go back to the opening statistic of 39% of our households in fuel poverty, and also those in the Western Isles in extreme fuel poverty. District heating opportunities, district heating storage, like the work that's been done by Star Energy from Glasgow in Norway. Look at the key issue of how we make this work properly. Edinburgh University is beginning to lead the way. And it's not just renewables news, it's also about low and zero carbon technologies. And it's the using a variety of different renewables and different heat technologies and bringing them together. Um, th the proposals at Edinburgh University have already generated savings of one and a half million a year and reduced CO2 emissions. The challenge is how to make those kind of projects work across the country. Um, our Scandinavian neighbours have got some of the solutions. It's about using new developments through support from grants and through planning approaches, but it's also about making sure that the public sector works with the private sector to bring this about. I think it's really, really exciting. Um, Mike McKenzie was right to kick off with the vision of Tom Johnson. We need that now in this parliament. No pressure, uh, Minister. I hope you'll get some of that in your concluding remarks tonight. Vision, ambition, the key steps to make the changes we need. We're up for that challenge in Scottish Labour. Let's work together to deliver on that. Thank, Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I call John McAlpine to be followed by Alex Johnson. Uh, can I too congratulate my friend Mike McKenzie on securing this important and timely debate. I was delighted to host an event in Parliament uh, with Heriot Watt University on their Energy Academy uh, last year and during that event we heard of the wide variety of technological storage solutions being researched by the university's talented team and some of them were mentioned by both uh, Mike McKenzie and Sarah Boyack in their speech. Um, but this is no academic subject. Last week we saw the very practical consequences of not investing in energy storage. We're repeatedly told that blackouts are the stuff of science fiction, presiding officer. But last week they nearly became a cold reality with the emphasis on cold. National Grid had to issue an emergency request for electricity 
due to an unexpected spike in demand. Its winter outlook report revealed capacity margins, as Mr Mackenzie mentioned, as low as 1.2 per cent. Now, the safe level is 5 per cent, and a capacity margin, presiding officer, is the average amount of extra electricity available compared to peak winter demand. So 1.2 per cent is worryingly low. So I was very pleased to hear that Mr Ewing had written to the minister who is responsible for this Amber Rudd at UK level to warn her against her complacency in this matter. UK energy policy, which Ms Rudd presides over, discriminates against Scottish renewables. That's well known. It discriminates against generators like Long Gannett, uh, which is forced to close early because of unfair transmission charges. That's well known. What's not so well known is how it discriminates against storage technology, another area in which Scotland can lead. And that discrimination is as Mr Mackenzie mentioned, contributes not just to damage to Scotland, but to supply issues right across the, the UK. As the WWF briefing today says clearly, the current UK energy market framework does not provide an adequate revenue stream for large storage projects, and there are no targeted support mechanisms. This, po uh, this point has been repeated to the Energy Committee by other experts and by the generators themselves, notably Scottish Power and SSE. We have two shovel-ready projects that are being held up by the UK government's policy failure in storage. They are the Kruachan extension, which is included in the NPF 3 for Scotland as a nationally important piece of infrastructure, as well as the Coir Glass by Loch Lochy. Between them, these two projects would bring, bring pumped storage capacity in Scotland to well over 2 gigawatts by 2030. And to put that into context, currently in, in Britain, there's around 3.24 gigawatt capacity of storage. So these two projects alone would make a significant contribution. It still wouldn't bring us anywhere near Germany, which already has 7 gigawatts of storage, and Spain with 8 gigawatts, and Japan with 25 gigawatts. Storage gives you more flexibility, and that's what these countries understand. And it's what ex expert witnesses have told the committee, and it's what the mechanical engineers uh, said last year in their very important uh, report on the subject. There is a fine art presiding officer in managing supply and demand when it comes to electricity, and the national grid has been forced to pay very large sums of money in, when it fails to balance supply and demand just to maintain some kind of equilibrium. We're always hearing about the constraint payments to wind farms, which we all accept are uh, intermittent. Um, but it's not just renewable energy uh, generators who receive these payments. They go to power stations as well. For example, in 2012 and 2013, the overall constraint payment uh, paid by National Grid was 170 million, but for uh, wind, it was 7 million. Now the public, with some degree of alarm, is becoming aware of something called demand-side balancing reserve, in which National Grid pays large industrial customers not to produce power. Payments here also run into millions and are set to increase, although there seems to be considerable secrecy around what they actually are. Meanwhile, the UK plan to address the crisis by spending billions doubling interconnectors with the continent and, of course, investing in nuclear energy. It would really be so much easier and cheaper to allow Scotland to develop its strengths in renewable energy and storage potential. But only this week we learned that Amber Rudd, while implementing policies that cut off investment to Scotland's renewable projects, is planning to pay to import renewable energy. So, presiding officer, the UK government and the regulator of GEM are presiding over a system where consumers are paying through the nose for a system that could have been invented by Lewis Carroll. It's quite simply absurd. One week we are paying firms to switch off. The next week we are paying astronomical amounts to keep the lights on. During last week's crisis, the grid close, paid... Please. I'm just finishing. The grid paid just... Uh, some uh, generators, uh, 250,000, uh, sorry, two and a half thousand pounds per megawatt hour when it's normally 50 pounds. Presiding officer, investing in energy story to overcome the issue of intermittence and ensure a smooth supply of green energy when we need it makes a lot more sense. And I very much hope that the UK government soon see sense on this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now have to ask members if they could try to keep to four minutes, please. And even at that, the number of members who still wish to speak in the debate means that I am minded to accept a motion from Mike McKenzie under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Mr McKenzie? Happy to move that motion. Many thanks. Is that agreed? 
Thank you. I now call Alex Johnston to be followed by David Torrance. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. One of the first things I was ever taught in a science class was that energy can never be created or destroyed. You can only change its form. And that, of course, is a lesson that we should all uh, take to heart when we're thinking about the need to store energy. Because too often we go for the high-tech solution when, in fact, low-tech is the right way to go. Many people will remember how uh, conditions in some areas of Africa were transformed when Trevor Bayliss had the genius idea of putting a clockwork mechanism on a radio. Uh, simple technology, ancient technology in some case kind, of some kind, which was put together uh, and served a modern function. For that reason, we should always be careful not to go for the high-tech solution when the low-tech solution will deliver. And if we look at the solutions to energy storage that we have available to us, it's already been said by a number of people that pump storage, hydro, is the way to go. We have certain difficulties in Scotland. Our mountains are not as high as they are in Norway or in the Urals. Uh, and the volume of water available is not as great as some uh, other countries would be able to achieve. But yet the opportunity to use surplus electricity at low cost to pump water up a hill so that you can let it back down through the turbines at a time when there is demand uh, and you can sell that electricity at a much higher price is a tremendous business model. And we should always remember that regardless of what government can or cannot do, that that business model is one that already pays handsomely to the company that operates that pump storage schemes. We should seek wherever we can to extend that technology because Virtually all of our uh, current hydro schemes would have some suitability for pump storage. But let's look at some of that. Uh, yes, indeed. Claudia uh, Beamish. Does the member agree with me that uh, that sort of pump storage, which I, I see on the Falls of Clyde as well and, and uh, is across Scotland, is a much better model than the centralised uh, nuclear energy model, which um, the member's party is arguing for with the very expensive... Um, waste issue that inv is involved with that. Alec Jones. Perhaps uh, have time to get onto the subject of diversity. I believe in diversity of energy sources. The one other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of low technology uh, is uh, what, something that's contained within this report, uh, and that is the sub uh, compressed air or liquefied air. Uh, I think we have a great deal to learn from work that has been done, particularly in India, uh, relating to the provision of cars that are powered by liquid air. And it's a wonderful way of storing energy, which is uh, almost like a spring, but it can achieve uh, great results. In the, the last minute available to me, I'd like to explain a little bit about how our electricity system works. Our electricity uh, is generated at 50 cycles per second. And you can test the load on the system at any moment from any socket in any wall. You simply check the rate at which the current is oscillating. And if it deviates more than a few fractions of a percent above or below that 50 cycles per second, someone in a control room somewhere is panicking trying to produce extra capacity or shut capacity down. As we move towards a system that is more environmentally based, it is vital that we have means for that capacity to be changed. And that's why, yes indeed, uh, generators, including wind turbines, are being paid to switch off because their value is greater if held in reserve than it is if simply used to displace something else. The fact is that if we put all our eggs in one basket, in any form of energy production, we put the continuity of our supply at risk. And that's why, as I said earlier in response to an intervention, that I will always campaign for diversity in our energy sources, because only through diversity can we have the consistency required to make sure that when you flick that switch, the power comes on? If we fail to be diverse in our sourcing of energy, then we run a much greater risk that it may not. Thank you. I call David Torrance to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, can I apologise to you and Mike McKenzie for not being able to stay till the end of the debate? 
I would like to thank Mike McKenzie for bringing this motion before Parliament, as I think it addresses an interesting and important factor in Scotland's energy future. All of us here today know that the Scottish Government has set progressive targets and introduced initiatives to boost Scotland's renewable energy sector. For example, Scotland now meets more than 50% of its electric needs through power from renewable sources. By 2020, we hope to supply 100% of our electricity demands from renewable sources, and we will continue to work towards that goal. To help our en energy industry grow, however, we need to invest in new and developing technologies. I believe that we need to look at energy storage in particular, which is a solution to one of the renewable energy sector's biggest problems. In many cases, excess energy generated by popular renewable sources, like wind turbines, is lost because it cannot be stored effectively. Therefore, I am proud to join my colleagues in support of the Scottish Renewables and its publication, Energy Storage, The Basics which showcases some of the most successful new storage technologies in Scotland. New storage technology will allow us to harness the maximum amount of energy produced and to fuel our country through renewable sources any time, not just when turbines are turning or the sun is shining. As Mike McKenzie rightly points out, the energy storage industry alone will be worth roughly £20 billion globally by 2022. It is essential then that Scotland develops a storage energy sector Therefore, thereby assuring a place for itself in this growing global market. The continued development of efficient energy storage technology is particularly important to me, as the energy sector drives a great deal of industry in my constituency in Kirkcaldy. I would therefore like to focus today on one of the types of energy storage specified in the constituency, hydrogen fuel cells. I am pleased to see that Scottish Renewables highlighted the work being carried out by hydrogen offices in Energy Park 5, located in Methil. As this case study for the expansion of hydrogen fuel storage, the Hydrogen Office was founded in 2011, with funding from Scottish Renewables and other local energy-aware organisations, with the goal of promoting efficient renewable energy, especially through hydrogen power. The Hydrogen Office now converts any excess energy produced by a turbine into hydrogen gas, which is stored in a high-pressure stainless steel tank. The fuel can be transferred to a 10 kilowatt fuel cell and used to power a hydrogen office at the energy park at up to 80% efficiency when the wind turbine does not provide enough real-time el electricity to the facility. The fuel cell, when full, can power the hydrogen office for up to two weeks. Perhaps the best benefit of using hydrogen to power the office is the fact that only a byproduct of the process is water. By using hydrogen power, the office has eliminated its carbon emissions entirely. I would also like to reinforce for the Chamber that hydrogen fuel storage is not just a technology feasible only for large scale facilities. The Hydrogen Office parent organisation, Bright Green Hydrogen, has created a pilot programme based in Leavemouth for the use of hydrogen fuel cars in vehicles. A fleet of 20 electric cars and vans plus two bin lorries use hydrogen fuel to continually charge their batteries, allowing the car to run for up to 200 miles without stopping. Presiding officer, in closing, I would like to say the Hydrogen Office is, one of the, is only one venture in the grand scheme of Scotland's energy needs. However, its success shows us that hydrogen fuel cells and the new energy storage technologies in general have an increasingly important place to play in Scotland's energy industry. The expansion of hydrogen fuel cells technology into smaller projects like powering cars will help Scotland transition to increased reliance on renewable sources. Converting the renewable energy to hydrogen gas could replace petrol, coal and natural burning gas in the future, eliminating Scotland's need for non-renewable source of energy entirely. I am proud to say that the organisation with my constituency has been at the forefront of developing this new technology. I know that it will soon be able to apply for new innovations across Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Nigel Dolan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I too congratulate Mike McKenzie uh, on securing this important debate and join him in acknowledging and welcoming the work done by Scottish Renewables through the launch of its new storage network and the uh, publication Energy Storage, uh, The Basics. Uh, as has been said, while well, we debate the issue of energy in this Parliament on a pretty regular basis, invariably uh, the focus is on generation, usually electricity generation rather than the wider contribution of heat uh, and transport. In turn, 
Uh, this has led to claims that demand reduction and energy efficiency um, are, are the Cinderella of the, of the energy debate, but um, I, I'm not sure that energy storage doesn't have a more uh, compelling claim uh, to this dubious honour. Invariably, it is a postscript to um, a speech here and there, and uh, apparent afterthought worthy of acknowledgement, but no real serious discussion in the context of the overall energy debate. And that is a failing on our part, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased we have an opportunity this afternoon, uh, albeit a brief one, uh, to begin to redress the balance and give storage its proper place. Uh, and storage is, as others have said, absolutely central to the achievement of our, our renewable energy uh, amb ambitions. As we strive to meet ever more challenging targets en route to decarbonising our energy system, storage solutions will play an ever more critical role role a point um, emphasised strongly by WWF in their briefing for today's debate. WWF also, I think, quite legitimately argue that the UK energy market does not provide an adequate funding system for storage projects and that this should be a priority for uh, development in the future. This, to be fair, I think has been a failing of successive governments both north and south of the border, but it's one we can ill afford uh, to see continue. That's not to say we are operating from a standing start. Scottish Renewables helpfully set out a range of activity that is already underway in Scotland, from the long-standing pump water storage operations at Kruachan, a direct legacy uh, of Tom Johnson, who's rightly been eulogised by many speakers earlier in this debate, to the more recent project in my own Orkney constituency, where collaboration between Shept and Mitsubishi has seen the UK's first large-scale battery connected to help ease grid constraints and allow for more renewable generation. I'm also excited by the progress of the Surf and Turf initiative uh, on ADI, deploying renewables to generate hydrogen, which is then used to provide electricity for ferries when tied up in the harbour. Uh, these are examples that really underscore the potential and the fundamental importance of storage in allowing us to connect more renewables ca capacity, deliver security of supply and empowering communities and consumers. I think perhaps one of the reasons there's been a tendency to overlook the contribution that storage can and must play in our efforts to decarbonise our energy system is the sheer range uh, of storage types. These vary in scale and stage of development. Harriet Watt University's Energy Academy, referred to earlier, illustrates the point well, explaining that, quote, heat and electricity storage will be required at timescales from seconds to years and from small battery scale to grid level solutions. I was interested to read about the partnership approach being taken by the Academy, bringing together different disciplines and facilitating collaboration across industries, research centres and other organisations. After the visit to Orkney last week by Harriet Watt's new principal, Professor Richard Williams, I hope there's more that the team at ICIT can contribute to this work in conjunction with the world-class cluster of renewable energy-related businesses to be found in Orkney. Of particular interest is the Academy's work on demand management systems, which could reduce the price of electricity and the use of virtual power plants to integrate renewable energy resources and demand to remoter communities. Deputy Presiding Officer, as we come to rely increasingly on renewable energy, we need to recognise that this reliance rests heavily on the flexibility and security that only storage solutions can provide. WWF calls on all political parties to embrace that vision. It is one, certainly, that Scottish Liberal Democrats do. It is time, Deputy Presiding Officer, that Cinderella Storage got her invitation to the Green Energy Ball. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Nigel Dawn to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I again want to thank Mike McKenzie for bringing this important debate to us. I'd also like to thank him for the history lesson about Tom Johnson and to reflect briefly that it was one... The, uh, I have a family connection with this as well because my grandfather was one of the civil engineers who did some of the heavy lifting, shall I say, in the uh, uh, work that was done on hydroelectric power stations across Scotland in times past. We all know that renewable energy is going to be intermittent. It's not just that the wind doesn't always blow. Of course, tides come and go, but there are very long slack periods in between. So storage is something which I think we would readily recognise as being part of a power system. I suspect that most of us actually have been as MSPs at briefings from the national grid. So we will know fine well that they are used to the idea of having to buy spare capacity and to paying over the odds necessarily for that at the peak. 
Uh, they also have bought themselves opportunities to reduce demand, as, been, as has been pointed out, and Joe McAlpine commented on that. I do not recall the grid ever actually talking about storage in any of our briefings. Um, or if they, they have done, it really was very much the Cinderella. So it's obviously been somewhat off their radar as well. But it's going to have to come on it, partly for the reasons that members have already mentioned, which I won't repeat, but partly because of a point which I don't think has yet been mentioned, which is that whilst we've all spent our time talking about renewable electricity generation, the biggest part of our energy demand is heat, both domestic and business. And if we're to use renewable energy to meet the heat demand, then we're going to have to generate a great deal more electricity, but we're also going to have to get it to where that heating is required <coughs> And, this is the crucial bit, make sure that it's available at the point when the heating is actually required as well, which might well be in the evenings and overnight rather than during the day when it might have been generated. So storage is actually a crucial part of simply getting the heat balance across Scotland in connection with renewables. Now, we've again, we've always known that standard generating power stations waste heat. We've all seen these enormous cooling towers and wondered why they were there. Well, the laws of thermodynamics demanded that they had to be there. But if those power stations had been built in the middle of our big cities, then we wouldn't have needed the cooling towers. We could actually have used that waste heat to warm up our houses, and district heating systems have been known in various places to do that. Which brings me to the next point, presiding officer, which is that we really should be storing heat, sorry, storing energy, where it will be useful as heat. Because many of the storage systems themselves generate waste heat. And if you can use that waste heat for district heating, then that must actually be far more efficient in overall energy terms. Now, if we can just take energy out of the sky by wind turbines, then actually the cost of that energy as energy isn't terribly great. But given that we actually have to put enormous amounts of capital both into the ground and then into the wires that move the energy around, we do want efficient systems. And that's why it is important that we get our storage in the right place. It needs to be distributed. But it does mean that compressed air, liquid air and flywheel storage, which are themselves relatively inefficient, if put in the right place, can actually become more efficient because the waste is always heat. And if you can collect that heat and put it into a storage, into a, uh, into a district heating system, then it ceases being wasted heat and becomes useful heat. So that is the point which, in all of this, adds to the complexity of what's already a complex enough problem. And I'm very grateful for Mike, to Mike McKenzie again for bringing that before us. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Stuart Stevenson. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Others have uh, referred to Tom Johnson, but there's one key aspiration that Tom Johnson had that was no, has not yet been referred to. He imagined that with the building of hydroelectric schemes, we would get to a position where no charge was made for the electricity that was supplied because there was no cost in the energy source from which it came. Now, that sounds like fantasy, except that it actually is now happening. It's happening in Texas. Uh, and I particularly, uh, in reading the New York Times on Sunday, uh, spotted that TXU, Energy of Texas, and Texas is the state in the United States with the highest proportion of wind energy, uh, installed wind energy, is now supplying to its customers between nine o'clock at night and six o'clock in the morning, all the electricity they can use at no charge whatsoever. So there is a future out there, if we get the infrastructure in the right place, uh, that enables us uh, to do things which are both environmentally uh, favourable, but also practically favourable uh, to con the consumers of energy. But of course, it's free overnight, because that's not when most people want it, which takes us neatly to the whole point uh, of storage. I uh, declare uh, for members, I'm a member of the Institution of Engineering and Technology. And in the October uh, uh, magazine, there's a monthly magazine of uh, up-to-date projects, they describe what's really a very exciting project indeed. It's a 
lithium oxygen uh, battery, uh, which uses graphene, that single atom level uh, graphite uh, carbon, uh, to protect the electrodes uh, from corrosion in the pure oxygen environment that's required in these batteries. And they have a demonstrator that's working in the lab. That means in 10 years' time it might be available to us as consumers. And this battery, weight for weight and volume for volume, is able to store the same amount of energy as a tank full of petrol. And it already, in demonstrator mode, is able, uh, theoretically, for one-fifth of the cost of present technology, one-fifth of the weight, uh, to travel 650 kilometres between Edinburgh and London. In other words, it's a direct and genuine competitor uh, with the current petrol and diesel engines uh, that we have in our cars today. Now, we can't guarantee it's going to come out of the lab and end up as a commercial product, but I think the, the portents are really uh, quite encouraging. And it is in the whole technology of batteries that we've seen enormous changes uh, taking, taking place. And, of course, the point about this is, of course, if you've got local generation, a turbine on your roof, and you're able to charge your car overnight uh, for a normal tank full uh, of energy, uh, that's pretty good because the transmission cost is nil. You're, un you're in control of what's going on. And, of course, there's huge environmental benefits. And I contrast that with, of course, uh, what the Financial Times was reporting on Tuesday last week, uh, where they tell us that so ill-managed has the energy supply been in the United Kingdom that the UK government is having to contract diesel-powered stations. And we now like diesel a lot less than we did a few months ago before Volkswagen uh, uh, revealed uh, to us uh, how polluting it is that we'll be spending 436 uh, million to provide excess diesel capacity precisely at a point where we're shutting down renewables. Doesn't it make sense? Excellent debate. Well done, uh, uh, Mike McKenzie. I look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. At which point I will now invite the Minister to respond to the debate and ask Fergus Ewing to take seven minutes or so to do so. Uh, well, I think this has been an excellent debate. Uh, thanks to Mike McKenzie bringing it forward and uh, welcoming very much Scottish Renewables Paper um, Energy Storage Basics, which I, I think uh, sets the context and certainly repays a close reading presiding officer it begins by stating that our demand for energy varies constantly throughout days, weeks and months, and our energy system needs to be flexible and deliver electricity and heat at the right times. And traditionally, this was done by a combination of fossil fuels primarily, with some nuclear, but increasingly this is uh, going to be done by a transition to low-carbon sources of energy, and we, I think we all accept that. Uh, the transition needs to be practicable and managed, and it needs, as Mr Johnson said, to incorporate a diversity and variety of supply, something I've always argued, uh, uh, but uh, a transition there must be, and the transition to low carbon renewable generation uh, is not straightforward because renewable generation is variable depending upon the weather, whilst nuclear is inflexible. And that means that we need to be both innovative uh, and long-standing storage technologies to provide greater flexibility must be brought forward. And ultimately, storage used in conjunction with renewables can help tackle climate change and decrease our reliance on fossil fuels and maintain our energy security. I was also um, interested in the report from the Institution of Civil Engineers presiding officer, published at the end of last month, which highlighted the storage's significant potential in helping to ease the tightening of capacity margins to manage increasing peak demand and the intermittency of renewables to meet renewables and emissions targets and to extend aging infrastructure and stem increasing costs. Uh, and they had two interesting recommendations. One was to exempt storage operators from balancing services use of system because pump storage pays twice effectively to draw in and then expel the, the energy twice. That's surely not fair. <clears throat> very, very sensible suggestion indeed. Secondly, classifying storage as a specific activity for distribution network operator DNOs. Um, and I think during the debate we've heard from various members, David Torrance, about the 
uh, the championing of hydrogen techniques in Fife. You've heard of the Aberdeen hydrogen bus experiment. Mr. Don uh, set out the need for uh, more storage solutions, a, a more electricity, more storage of heat as, as, uh, as, as well. Uh, a, the Sarah Boyack pointed to district heating where uh, we already have 10,000 homes and hope, I believe, practically to obtain another 16,000 in the district heating network by 2020 with an ambition to obtain a further 14,000 on top of that. Uh, and Stuart Stevenson's remarks reminded me of the truism that no matter how well informed any minister may be, minister for energy may be, no matter how diligent and hardworking, uh, technological advances will always be far ahead of the minister, although not far ahead of Mr. Stevenson. Um, presiding officer, I think the, going back to the Scottish Renewables report, I can't really beat the description of the, uh, of the report in various sections. And let me quote, pumped hydro storage, how it works. Pumped storage schemes work by using electricity to pump water from a lower to a higher reservoir where it can be stored and then when required, released to generate electricity as a conventional hydroelectric power station would. Energy release time, 10 seconds to two minutes. That would get rid of the 2,500 pounds a megawatt hour cost, which we saw on a spike in a day when the weather wasn't cold. Uh, so uh, the benefits of pumped hydro storage have been considered against the high costs in the past. And one of the uh, arguments that I've put to Amber Rudd at a meeting several weeks ago was that in an electricity system, which we have in the UK, where increasingly there is a greater new renewables component, which is stochastic, then the benefits of pump storage become far greater than they used to be in a conventional fossil fuel model. And therefore, uh, we have asked that the, the model, the cost-benefit analysis, be reconsidered by experts in order, I think, to demonstrate that although it is not cheap, it is not as expensive as is, I think, believed, perhaps by the national grid, who are supposed to be uh, a technology energy source neutral, I believe. Uh, so we, we hope that they will take that message. And indeed, I met Cordy O'Hara, their new chief executive, last week and delivered it in person. We have always argued that there should be more storage solutions. This is not new. I've been arguing this uh, from the outset. It's incorporated in our energy generation policy statement. I called several years ago for there to be an intergovernmental group between Scotland and the UK to look at pump storage and find a means of making it work. In other words, financeable. Sadly, Ed Davy at that time, who I suspect was personally supportive of the idea, uh, did not approve the idea. However, I've suggested an alternative proposal to Amber Rudd when I met her some weeks ago, which is that there should be a, a UK government devolved administration expert group that should, well, I, I'd really like to make these points. I'm very sorry because I need to, to make progress. There, there should be an expert group uh, of, comprised of senior officials uh, I, a, of the UK government and devolved administration, and it should specifically be tasked to look at flexibility, which would incorporate storage, uh, interconnection, and other methods of providing flexibility in the grid. In other words, it would look at the issue in the round. Now, signing officer, I think as many members have indicated, um, the, the requirement for more storage is not something which is going to be optional. It is something which I think will prove to be essential, a sine qua non of a system where there's more renewables and indeed where the capacity margin is parlously low, as we've seen of late. And we will also need storage, not only at transmission level of pump storage, but as members have said, at distribution and indeed at household level. And members have talked about battery storage, uh, lithium batteries, uh, uh, liquid compressed air, hydro storage, and domestic thermal storage, and indeed other forms. And I'd like to, to refer again to the Scottish Renewables Report, who referred to the East Lothian-based company SunAmp, who have developed the SunAmp PV system, which is designed to store excess electricity from a solar PV array as heat. And it can later deliver fast-flowing hot water on demand. And SunAmp are set to install over 700 units of SunAmp PV and other SunAmp heat battery products in over 1,000 homes across Falkirk, Edinburgh, and the Lonians. So I visited this company, and I've described them before as the Scottish answer to Tesla. 
We have encouraged various uh, activities through our Local Energy Challenge Fund, uh, some in Mrs. Mr. Torrance's area, some in East Lothian, and some throughout the country. But in conclusion, Presiding Officer, I think we do need to see the UK Government recognise the key role that storage has to play as we move forward. It is absurd that, as Mr Stevenson said, we need 1.5 gigawatts of diesel power at a cost of £436 million, a temporary and polluting solution, leaving no long-term legacy. We have the pump storage resources in Scotland. We should be used by the UK. They should find a method of incentivising this. There are only three gigawatts of pump storage in Britain. That compares with eight gigawatts in Austria, uh, and Germany and France have twice as much as the UK. Uh, therefore, in conclusion, presiding officer, I do think that across the chamber there have been very useful contributions to this debate, uh, and uh, I think it's a topic that we will come back to on many future occasions, and rightly so. Uh, thank you again to Mr Mackenzie for allowing this debate this evening. Thank you. And that concludes Mike Mackenzie's debate, Energy Storage Network. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>